Welcome to what I hope will become a highlight um, of our uh, series of board meetings. In almost 10 years, I had the pleasure now to direct CUT, and some five years ago, we started off with a topic of roadmaps. Um, roadmaps for developmental and reproductive toxicology for cancer and others. And uh, we are most excited that we got a triplet, um, or actually learned it's a quadruplet today, because you should get used uh, at CUT, you get more than we promise. Uh, we will hear about four roadmaps, because Susie Fitzpatrick from FDA just told me she will also talk about the roadmap of TOX21, so uh, we have a really dense program here. I will um, not consume too much of their time. Um, I'm really happy to have all three here. Um, we are for the first time also uh, streaming this via the web, so we have a for me, unknown number of participants uh, out in the wide open, which I would like to welcome by doing so. Here we have some of the faculty uh, from Hopkins, some guests and mostly board members of our center for the board meeting, which takes place tomorrow. So, Vaughan Casey um, is a friend and collaborator for many years. He's heading NICEATM, um, which is the part of the National Toxicology Program which is supporting validation studies. And I'm most excited to leave the floor to him and tell us about their roadmap for alternative methods. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Thomas. So, as Thomas said, I'm going to talk about a roadmap we've been working on with this committee that's mentioned up here, ICFAM, which is a interagency coordinating committee on the validation of alternative methods. Uh, the person that developed this committee loved acronyms, and it used to be hyphenated, ICFAM NICETAM, one giant acronym. Uh, but this is a congressionally mandated committee composed of representatives from these 16 agencies. So we have um, Susie Fitzpatrick is representing the FDA, but we also have people from the other centers of the FDA. Gino's there for EPA toxics. We have Anna Lowett for pesticides. So we have every major division of, of the government agencies represented within this group. Uh, and this is something that came out of uh, a colleague of mine, Brian Barrage. He was formerly at GSK. Uh, three years ago, he came to me and said, why doesn't the United States have a roadmap? This is when the NC3Rs had just come out with their roadmap. Um, the Netherlands was working on their roadmap. And he said, why don't we have a roadmap? And I was like, what are you talking about? We have a three-year plan and a five-year plan for this committee. But the more we talked, the more I realized we did not have a roadmap. We didn't have a strategy that we could actually put out for people and, and have them follow it. it, it you, and as I'll be discussing, there is a, a desperate need to actually think about what we're doing and not just turn the handle faster on the old things we were doing. So that's what this is all about. And as fate would have it, this was issued January of this year. And Brian Barrage took over head of the National Toxicology Program in January of this year. So it was quite coincidental that he you know, kind of initiated this. ICFAM has put a ton of work into it over the past three years. And now we're in the middle of implementing it. So anybody that's been in science for very long has seen both of these career, both of these Cartoons, uh, we've seen them a thousand times. On the left, we have the uh, Sid Harris uh, classical, you, you've got, you start from A, you're gonna go to B, but you don't quite know how you can get there. And it really takes kind of a miracle. Uh, and then we have tox testing in the 21st century, which is the NRC's vision for how things are going to be. And really, this is kind of the scenario we have. We know where we are, we know where we wanna go, this document doesn't say anything about how to get there. This document was written by academics, by and large, one regulator from EPA, California. So saying where we're going to go is great, but if we're going to get there, we have to be very specific about how we're going to do it. It doesn't just happen. Um, and it's too easy to get caught up in the new technologies and how fun that is and not actually answer the really hard questions of how are we going to go from what we have now to where we're going to get in the future. And that's really the purpose of the roadmap that we worked on. So one of the biggest problems we face isn't scientific. Um, and here's an example. This is the, the axis of medieval. Uh, Myanmar, Liberia, and the United States. What do they have in common? 
There are only three countries, and the United States is the only developed country in the world that doesn't use the metric system. We've been trying since 1866 to get people to use the metric system in the United States. And it's not gonna happen. It's never gonna happen. Why? Because we've always done it this way. And we're always gonna use pecks and quarts and bushels and when the rest of the world is doing what we know to be right. Everybody, scientists know it's the right thing to do. And it, it makes so much more sense. It's easier. It's never gonna happen. And this is exactly the kind of problem we're facing with moving away from animal testing. We've always done it this way. It is institutionalized. It is entrenched in everything we do from policy to practice. And to get out of that, we've got to think broader than the old vision of, oh, well, it's the FDA. They won't accept new methods. That's the problem. Or it's ECFAM or NICETAM is just not validating things fast enough. That's, those are just very minute pieces of the puzzle. The, the puzzle is much bigger. And we have the rat oil build D50 test introduced 1927. Same year Ford came out with Model A. Still the most popular, most used, most conducted test in the entire world, or ver versions of it. That's mind blowing. I give, I give this talk to toxicologists. I've given it to our center directors, Linda Birnbaum. She absolutely didn't believe that people were still doing this. You've got to stop saying that because we don't do that test anymore. Like, yeah, we actually do. We actually do that test, and we still do the Dre's test. Extremely common. It, and one of the, the problems we're facing is with our own community. People think, we're done with this. We've got an OECD test guideline that takes care of that. Why are you still working on the Dre's test stuff? The bottom line is, a lot of the OECD test guidelines don't work. They got a box checked, and they're off to the next thing. So where are the resources now to go back and actually do this in a way that meets the needs of, of all regulars? We know that the, one of the most common, most popularized uh, ocular tests, the BCOP, doesn't work for pesticide formulations. It doesn't even come close to working. It probably, there are a lot of other things it doesn't work on. A lot of our alternative methods that have been validated or approved simply don't work on the chemicals that the regulators need them to work on. And that's a challenge in itself, because nobody wants to go back and say, oh, we got it wrong. And so we have these alternative tests that people are not using. We have a lot of them that have been validated. Nobody's using them. Many times nobody wanted them to start with. And so we've got to figure out how to stop doing what we've been doing in the past. And the thing is, so it's not just the old stuff. This is... Uh, Francis Collins, director of NIH, testifying to Congress in 2017, why do you need money in 2018? We're gonna eliminate animals for safety testing. 10 years, they're gonna be gone. Lower, lower cost, more accurate, higher throughput, problem solved, 10 years. Stem cells and tissue chips. Okay, so this is really a two-edged sword because it's good to know that NIH is recognizing the need to do something about toxicity testing. It's good to know they're putting resources into tissue chips and iPS cells. Those are very important. But the problem is people actually believe this. And when people believe it, they have expectations that are completely not realistic. Uh, and it's this is almost exactly the same thing we had with the Tox 21, the, the report. Dr. Collins is an amazing scientist. He's not a regulator. That statement clearly shows that he does not understand the registration process for chemicals and drugs in the United States. The safety assessment done on drugs and chemicals is entrenched and you're not going to tissue chip and stem cell your way out of the current process. So for one example, uh, and even at, at a recent tissue chip, I was, tissue chip meeting at Keystone, I was at. The head of a, the major tissue chip company got up and said, well, it's simple. We do one chip as one animal. That's how we're going to replace it. So this is a, this is a, these are the tissues collected in a GLP tox study. And Gino tells me it's, this is for FDA. Gino tells me it's exactly the same for EPA. 42 to 45 tissues per animal plus this thing here, anything else that you see when you're doing a necropsy, you don't tissue chip your way out of this. I mean, that, it doesn't even make sense to say, okay, I've got a heart on a chip, check the box, you can register your drug. 
if we ever want to replace animal testing, we've got to back up and understand the information that regulators are getting from this and find a way to help them get that same information. And it's not going to be one chip at a time or through a stem cell assay. Here's another example. These are 22 to 25 tests, separate animal tests that are required for the registration of a pesticide active ingredient. 14,000 animals. You don't tissue chip your way out of this. this. This requires a lot of thinking. It requires thinking on both sides. It requires the regulators saying, okay, here's what we need to get out of this, and test method developers and scientists saying, okay, here's how we can help. And one thing I don't think we've done a good enough job of in the past is reaching back far enough. So uh, the FDA, NIH, and pharma are, are involved with evaluating tissue chips. And I don't think you could have asked for a better approach to that. But I think that doesn't even go far back enough. We need to get academics involved in understanding the big picture of what we're trying to do, not so much saying we need a heart, we need a liver, we need a kidney. Back up even further and say, we have all this. How can we get this information using new technology? And just as an aside, the registration of a pesticide uses far more animals than the registration of a drug. Uh, and the reason is that with pesticides, you don't get to know the answer. You, as far as going into humans, is it going to be toxic or not? With drugs, you make a guess, you have a very gradual uh, introduction into clinical trials, and you find out eventually if you're right or wrong. Pesticides don't get that opportunity unless something goes really, really wrong, and then it's, it's a big problem. So they have to do so many animal tests to, to, to cover so many bases, uh, and that's why they use far more animals than the registration of a small molecule. So that's the whole purpose of this roadmap approach we developed. We worked with regulators, and we worked with industry stakeholders, and we worked with our animal welfare friends, and we just started actually putting pen to paper, trying to write down what it is we think needs to happen. Uh, at a very high level. So this is, these are general principles. You'll hear Susie and Gino talk about how this carries over to their agencies and, and how they implement their own roadmaps. Uh, but it was extremely helpful to get all these people in one room. We eventually uh, got about 88, 90 people in one room, started actually writing things down, and that's where you really start to see differences. Because we all think we're saying the same thing, but once somebody writes it down and you get a reaction, that's where you find out actually we're not talking about the same thing at all. So it was a two-day facilitated workshop, lots of sticky notes, flip charts, that kind of thing, that really kind of got us to a starting point. And then we, another year we worked on developing it. And this little swirly thing in the middle, well, well so the title is Strategic Roadmap for Establishing New Approaches to Evaluate the Safety of Chemicals and Medical Products in the United States. That title in itself is really, really important. Chemicals and medical products. We're not, the old Tox 21 report was chemicals. We can't silo like that. The FDA has more knowledge about human health than anybody else. Pharma has a ton of information on human health and animal studies. And the chemical industry is also, they have their own expertise. We need everybody working together and not pretending like these are completely different things. Because it's basically, how does xenobionics impact human physiology? That's, we all want to answer the same question. Um, so having the FDA especially step up and say, yeah, we want to be part of this, was really important. Uh, actually, it first said drugs or pharmaceuticals, and Susie came back and said, no, we want to change it to medical products, which includes everything the FDA regulates. So um, I've never seen agencies this willing to work together and this committed uh, and I don't know why, but it, it has just been an amazing process that the agencies are sincerely interested in working together and solving this problem. And I think you'll see that from the presentations coming up. So one of the first things we did was tackle the old approach to validation. This is what we have been doing for years. It's what OECD recommends, essentially, which is 
you have this technology that's been developed and you put it through some kind of validation process and when that's finished, you hope regulators will accept it and if regulators accept it, you hope industry will use it. That has proven not to be very effective. Uh, it's very time consuming, it's costly. I mean, we spent eight years and almost $10 million to get a transactivation assay validated a transactivation assay that nobody wanted. <laughs> and regulators specifically said, we don't even care if this happens. But no, we, we put our money in, we put the time in. Um, and that's just the epitome of, of the problem with this system. Uh, so what really needs to happen is it needs to be expanded and circularized. We can't have these things developed in isolation. We have, if you're going to develop a test method, I don't know how many people have come to me, three or four per year. CEOs of companies come in and say, I've got the best thing ever. This is a great technology. Who can use it? And that's my question. Who, who is supposed to use it? I don't know. Everybody should because it's so great. You, you can't do that. You have to be able to say, this is for EPA Office of Pesticides addressing this testing requirement. And so many people don't. They, they develop a technology thinking that if they build it, they will come. And that's just not the way to do it. We have to start with the regulatory need first, which puts the burden on us, or the, uh, the challenge on us to accurately convey what is needed. And that's something we have not done well in the past. So we need to circularize this process. We need to connect the regulators with the test method developers. And that's what this, this emblem is supposed to represent. So there are three big parts to it. One is connect end users with the developers. Uh, the other one is we need to really rethink the way we do validation. It can't just be three ring trials and, and that whole OECD process for everything. There, there are other ways of doing things that are much faster. And what we found, if, if the agencies are driving it, if, the, if it's a top-down requirement, if they want a method to happen, it can happen fast. The EPA has implemented... Um, a draft guidance on uh, accepting alternatives for skin sensitization. They did that in like a month. After, after they saw the data, they said, that's good enough for us, done. That's years ahead of, of anybody else in the entire world. Um, they did the same thing with replacing dermal toxicity testing. If they, they look back at their records, they say, we never regulate on dermal LD50s. We don't need them, done, months. When the regulators are involved, when they are getting what they need, things happen extremely quickly. Um, and then the last thing, if we do those first two, we should have methods that people actually want and use. So during this whole process, uh, we came up with what we call the three C's, communication, collaboration, and commitment. And this wasn't done in an attempt to come up with a catchy new acronym. This, was, this came out of that sticky note exercise we did where we had hundreds and hundreds of sticky notes. Almost every single one of them had one of these words on there. And it just became very apparent after reading all these that, okay, we see a theme here. Um, and they just happened to start with C. So it makes for a good little catchphrase. So the communication turns out to be one of the most important aspects of this. We, you know, we're happy doing our science and we think we're, we're fine. Uh, we don't really need to explain what we're doing to people. But what we're seeing now is if we're not explaining what we do to the public, to Congress, legislation gets introduced that makes absolutely no sense, uh, that's not enforceable, that would cause tremendous burden on industry and agencies, um, we have got to do a much better job of communicating what we're doing and why we're doing it to the public. And I think during that process, it really makes us question or go through what are we doing and why are we doing it. So it's, it's a good opportunity to kind of reevaluate the processes that we've established. Uh, collaboration, we recognize that not only are we going to need interagency collaboration, we absolutely need partnerships in industry. Public-private partnerships are going to be a key to this. We can't, there's no way we can do it alone. And commitment comes in many different forms, but one of the things that we recognize uh, that we've heard feedback from from day one is agencies need to step up and say what they actually need. For, for years, that's the number one complaint of test method developers. I don't know what you guys accept, and agencies are 
kind of cagey. Well, we might, we might not. I don't know, just go ahead and do it. Nobody's going to develop a method unless they know an agency is going to accept it. Uh, agencies are reluctant to accept it unless they know people are using it. So we need to get past this catch-22. And I think you'll see um, across the board, agencies are really stepping up, uh, making their testing requirements, expectations uh, more clear, and coming out with their own roadmaps uh, that help people understand their requirements. Uh, finally, we know what we know that international collaboration is absolutely important. It doesn't matter what we do here. If it's not harmonized, people aren't going to use the test because they don't want to do two tests, an alternative test and the animal study if they have to submit those all over the world. So this is a major focus of ours. We work through this international collaboration, uh, cooperation alternative test methods, ICADM, which has the US, Canada, EU, Japan, Korea, Brazil, and China right now. We're trying to continue to expand that. We work closely with OECD as well, um, and to some degree ICH, although that's mostly FDA-centric. Um, and I hope you can tell this is different than anything that's been put forth before. The main thing is that it's driven by federal agencies. It's driven by the people that actually are going to be accepting the test methods. They are telling folks how it has to happen. Uh, it's both chemicals, medical products, and the other thing is we're not just putting this thing out here and 10 years later you're going to say whatever happened to that. We have uh, a web page that you can go and track everything we're doing. So the first six projects we do are related to the acute toxicity tests. We have three of them already up. Um, there's a whole list of check boxes that we go through with every single one of these. For example, the very first thing is to identify agency requirements across the entire federal government and international. So test method developers know what the standards are. Uh, and then we just, we go through a whole checkbox. And three times a year, somebody from NYSEDM or ICFAM will be standing up in front of the public telling people where we are with this. And you can go anytime and just look at the website. And that's it. It's, we're, we've got a long way to go. It's really helpful if we're going in the right direction. Uh, it's not gonna be fast, but we've wasted a lot of time going in the wrong direction. So this, what this is for is to try to get everybody aligned, at least heading in the right direction. I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, thank you very much, Warren. Um, I did not explain the process in the beginning. Oh. Uh, what we are foreseeing here is three presentations, and then we will have about half an hour of discussion uh, of everything. So if there's a burning question for him, I would take it right now. Um, if not, I would ask the next of our board members to, to present, and I think it's uh, up to Gino now, yeah? Okay. Good. I'll use that. Good. So Gino is one of the latest additions to our board of the Center for Terms to Animal Testing. He is with the US EPA and has a very interesting role now in implementing the Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act for the 21st century. For this reason, okay, yeah. um, we are very excited to have him here. Here it is. And normally, oops. this is something. It's always difficult when the Mac person starts. Uh, okay, here, here we go. Thanks. And what do I do? The, uh, use this microphone. This, and, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks and good afternoon. Is this loud enough? Is it okay? Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the EPA strategic plan uh, to promote development and implementation of alternative test methods, um, status and update. Um, I always enjoy listening to Warren because I learn something every time. But the medieval thing was kind of interesting. Um, so I think as most of you know, and I apologize for those who've seen this several times before, so the Toxic Substances Control Act was originally enacted in 1976, and it went for 40 years before it changed. And in June of 2016, um, it was amended drastically, uh, and it was called the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act for the 21st Centuries. And um, this put a lot of new requirements for both new and existing industrial chemicals 
um, in, in the U.S. And one of the more important things that's of most interest to this group, I'm sure, is the fact that Section 4, which was the section of the old TSCA that talked about testing orders and how we asked for testing, was changed by adding a new subsection, which is um, reduction of testing invertebrates. So I was going to quick, quickly talk about the three major sections of this new subsection. In the first one, that's the, the part of the subsection that talks about um, before we can ask for testing, this is what we have to do. We have to consider any reasonably available scientific information, and we have to encourage and facilitate the use of uh, alternative te valid test methods and strategies that reduce or replace vertebrate animals while providing information of equivalent or better scientific quality, which is uh, interesting. We would uh, encourage and facilitate the grouping of chemicals, which many people realize that's the concept of read across, or you take a similar chemical with some information and you apply it to another, so you don't have to do some duplicative testing. And then it also asks us to encourage the formation of industry consortia to do some testing that might be important so that there's no duplicative testing, no more animal testing, if it has to be done, than is absolutely necessary. The second part of this new subsection is the one that kind of has been ruling my life since February of 2017. And that is, in implementing this part of the law, we, uh, the EPA has to, within two years, develop a strategic plan to promote the development and implementation of alternative test methods and strategies. And that's what I'll spend the bulk of the time talking about, which I guess is another term for the roadmap. You know, it was kind of interesting when you talked about the February 17 meeting face-to-face. That Monday was when I was given the assignment to work on this strategic plan. And so I actually phoned into that just for the first day. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to get into? So it was really interesting, though, to hear what was clearly um, a passionate discussion, which was hard for me to deal with over the phone. But I just remember. So I only know, I only know Warren for a year and, and many of the folks here. So I'm clearly a new neophyte. But this group in CAT has been around for so long and has done such amazing things, it's fun to be a part of it. The third part of the law says that if anybody wants to submit information to EPA under TSCA, they need to um, first attempt to develop the information by means of an alternative test method before conducting any new vertebrate animal testing. And here I'd just like to say, for those who don't know, Warren gave a great summary of what's required for pharma pesticides, and the fact that many in most industrial countries in the world do require some testing for biocidal materials, such as pesticides or pharmaceuticals. Um, however, EPA, uh, US, is the only industrialized country that does not require any testing for industrial chemicals. Most others do have what's called a minimum data set, which is kind of interesting, because the concept of a minimum data set suggests, not for biocides, but that there's some kind of uh, you know, a, a group of studies that should be used to characterize a chemical you know nothing about. So that's the mindset that I've been raised in since I've been at EPA, and I think that's important. So that's the three sub subsections of sec subsection 4H. So what I'd like to talk about for the next few minutes is the development of the strategic plan. And is, even though it's on the last slide, this is something that um, we were able to draw on uh, folks from other parts of the agency, the folks at the National Comp, uh, Comp Talk Center um, and uh, Anna Lowett from OPP. So they were uh, heavily involved in writing the first draft. Unlike the ICVAM roadmap, which took a while, we started in late December. So we took a couple months to do the first draft, which came out in March. And many of you have had the chance to comment on it and attended some public meetings. But the way it all started was in November, we had a public meeting where we had some goals and strategies, and again, some of you were there, so that was November of 17. Then we really started getting going in December and January. So the, the draft plan that came out, and I do want to say draft, because we are reviewing the comments that we've received. We are making some changes, and so you know, I, I, do, I do need to stick to what's in the draft, but uh, I, I want to be able to showcase some stuff. So in the draft, and then looking at what you were doing, Warren, it's almost sad to say it's the, almost like the linear thing that you pointed out, but let's pretend it does go in a circle. Because the, the concept here for these four things, which are important, is you know, 
identifying what NAMs you're interested in and making sure you can develop them and then figure out some way to bring them together to make some kind of regulatory decision. So that's like the first thing, identify, develop, and integrate the NAMs. And I think one of the hardest things to do for some uh, organizations such as EPA and countries like, uh, in the U like the U.S., if there's no minimum data set, how do you do that? Uh, last week's public meeting of the ICFAM, when Warren showed that slide of the tissues used in a, in a conventional study, the light bulb went out because people always ask, Gino, well, what do you ask for? Well, we just ask for a general tox when we know nothing. And the reason we do that is you dose the animal and you look for anything. So tissues on a chip for the 45, it's not going to work as you pointed out. So th that I should have thought of that a year ago to show people how and why we ask the questions. We don't know how to ask the questions that you need to hear as the developers. We will get there though. I do think it's, it's gonna be hard. So once, once you come up with identifying, developing and integrating, then it's all about the confidence, right? You wanna establish the uh, relevance and reliability uh, in order to have confidence in using it. And relevance and reliability are in the law. Education, training, and collaboration, I think, speaks to the three C's almost, if you want to bring the ICVAM roadmap in here, because it's all about getting us as EPA scientists an, under, an understanding on, on the new science that's out there so that we can use it properly, um, and then collaborate with everybody who's been doing this work for years and make sure that we get up to speed. And then the final thing is in the plan, it's only it's as good as the implementation. So we've established the Tosca NAM team, which is an EPA group, the TNT. I think that's cool. <laughs> the last thing I want to say about this is um, the way the law was written, the whole thing is alternative test methods and strategies, alternative test methods and strategies. In the past year and a half or so, um, the new term of art is NAMs. Um, new approach methodologies. It is kind of interesting in the comments we've received. There's some very interesting differences of opinion on, on whether that's the right term or an appropriate term. But I think as long as we explain clearly, you know, the law says alternative test methods and strategies, and we, we appreciate that we, can, we may consider this synonymous, then I think we can all be on the same page. So this is a figure I know it shows linearly, but um, that, uh, I, uh, that uh, Rusty Thomas and John Cowden put together. And, and it gets at the three most important point, points. I define developing and integrating the, the NAMs, building the confidence, and then implementing it. Education and training isn't in here because these are the three core components. But I think the important thing here is these inner circles, which may or may not be in the final, but the point is within each of these core components, if you're going to be thinking about a strategy, there's going to be near-term, intermediate, and long-term objectives or activities. And throughout that, this whole figure and, uh, you know, uh, is, is the, the um, idea of fit for purpose, which is a term that's been used forever, uh, or it, it has been used by many uh, uh, groups and organizations, and it's and, and it, it makes perfect sense. You want to make sure that the NAM or alternative method you're interested in is going to be used for what it's, it, uh, it, it has uh, the appropriate context. And I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the right context under Tosca. And it's not working. Oh, there it is. See, if you push harder, it works. So um, fit for purpose for us is new chemicals program. As I might have mentioned, we don't have any minimum data set, so anyone who submits a pre-manufacture notice, which means that's a, uh, an application to introduce a new chemical into commerce in the U.S., they don't have to supply any data unless they've generated it for another jurisdiction. And, and we do, most of the data we get is because a company has generated it for use in REACH, Japan, Australia, or some other country. So, but that, that's how we get data when it comes in with a PMN. If we see it for the first time in the world, which happens often, there's no information. So we've often used um, what are NAMs, alternative test methods, to make some estimates on our concerns. The ECOSAR is our uh, internal program, which is publicly available, that looks at aquatic toxicity. Oncologic is an expert-driven program that was developed by a couple of our scientists, looks at cancer. EpiSuite is for PCAM properties, which we and others understand can play an important role in trying to figure out 
where a chemical might go in the environment and how it may or may not be bioavailable to people or um, environmental organisms. We've developed what we call the new chemical categories document. Over the years, we've um, made decisions that, because novel chemistries are happening, and so when we have some boundaries of a chemical class, then we might announce we feel comfortable that if your chemical was in this within this class, then we can make some decisions from a regulatory perspective on what effects we'd be interest we think are going to occur and the testing you might want to do. And of course, the whole thing I think with the NAMS is rethink this categories document from an alternative standpoint. And then the read across and just conventional structure activity relationships. So that's for the new chemical side. On the existing chemical side, with the new law, we now have to prioritize the chemical inventory, 38,000 or so that are in commerce. Um, and we have to prioritize them, figure out which ones are going to be high priority to do risk assessments, which are called risk evaluation, or low priority, which means we already, we, we're going to be making a, a, a cognizant decision that we're not concerned about 20 chemicals a year. So we have to make that decision. That's going to be based on hazard and exposure. These are risk-based prioritizations. So we envision a large role for NAMS in identifying candidates for prioritization and prioritization. And as Warren said, when it comes down to the risk assessment or risk evaluation, I think I and many people are worried about, you know, it, it is going to be a long road. But, but that, that's the thinking for fit for purpose. And now this next slide is new. I didn't show it till last week. <laughs> no, I'll take a drink. That might help. It, I don't know. Oh, you know what I did? I moved the slide thing. In the, um, is it a pointer? Okay, Bef in the 2000, before the new law, for new chemicals, we only had to worry about these two um, blocks to the left. We would make a finding that it may, something may present a hazard or, or um, it presents a hazard or it may present a hazard. Everything else we didn't worry about. So they were dropped. And that means they were allowed to go in commerce. The new law says two new things. We have to make a case that something's not likely to present a hazard or a, a risk. It's exposure and, and, and hazard. So by that, that means we have to be confident. And in order to be confident, we sometimes might need more information even though we might have some internal ideas that it might not be a problem. And then this is the big one. If, we're, if there's not enough information to make a decision, that also is one of the new decision points. So I know there's been some concern, rightly so, about the recent increase in the number of animal tests that we have been asking for. Part of it, much of it, is these are two new ways that we have to make decisions. So we have to think about a different way to do this from the alternative standpoint, but this is now one of our, our requirements. And there's actually a fifth box if it's a high production volume chemical. Some chemicals come in the door with the PMN and it's gonna be, they, they say, we're gonna produce over a million pounds of this. So th that kicks in an exposure-based finding which we can also use legally to ask for information. And I think the other thing that's kind of interesting in the new law, data was stricken and replaced with the word information, which I think sets the, sets the uh, road for going down the path of NAMS. And this was the context for the existing chemical side, and it just points out the prioritization effort and how we think that there's going to be a major role for uh, NAMS in this. And we had a public meeting in December, and uh, our folks, our, our colleagues down in ORD, NCCT, the National Comp, they're heavily involved in this prioritization exercise. And I know there's going to be a lot of use of some um, NAMs in that activity. So in, it, it just quickly, in, in, in the draft plan, when we talked about identifying, developing, and integrating NAMs, there, there are just four major categories when we talk about developing NAMs, at least in our view and the way we presented it. And that's know your chemical, the chemical characterization, the PCHEM properties, hazard identification, which I think is what most people think about when they think about NAMs, the concept of looking for hazard. Um, those symmetry and in vitro to in vivo extrapolation, that's specifically put in there to understand the importance and role of figuring out how we're going to use the new information that's being developed largely in 
dishes in vitro. The, you know, understanding the chemical movement in the NAM, in, in the NAM uh, 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 technology, and then extrapolating it to people and environmental organisms. And then characterizing exposure. And I, I know some people may not uh, uh, see this as a role of NAMs, but um, there is there is there is clearly a, a potential for this. If there's no or low exposure, we might not need to ask for any testing. So that plays a role in coming up with uh, understanding NAMs and and their development. Um, and once once we uh, have a group of NAMs that we're interested in, um, we have to figure out some way to bring it all together. The, the two parts of the new law talk about the weight of scientific evidence and the best available science and the concept of information of equivalent or better science quality than the traditional animal models. These are high bars that we're going to have to have to uh, get over in order to use dams in the regulatory setting. Um, but the important point here is if we're going to end up breaking things apart as getting away from whole in vivo vertebrate animal testing, there has to be some way to bring it all back together f to make some biological sense. And I think that's where some of these integrated frameworks, such as the adverse outcome pathway, the defined approaches, you know, the integrated assessment and test, uh, integrated and testing assessment approaches, all in the OECD and NICVAN. I know I'm throwing out a lot of acronyms. It's all in the draft plan, and I think many of you are familiar with them. But these are all going to be important. So that's the first major wheel in that three-figure thing. Then the next one is the relevance, reliability, and confidence. And we're going to be relying a lot on the OECD guidance document that talks about good in vitro management practices and the concept of whether something's regular, relevant for a specific regulatory context, new chemicals, prioritization, risk evaluation, and if it's re reproducible. And that gets into the whole V word thing, which we're not going to talk about, and transparency. But what we've proposed in the draft plan largely takes from the work that's been done by, uh, in the OECD arena by our colleagues at JRC and elsewhere, largely for the skin sensitization project, but where are these eight criteria that would be, could be used to identify NAMs that could be uh, um, important in the regulatory arena. Um, the, uh, then the education, training, and, and collaboration pretty self-explanatory. It's almost like the three C's with the new science. We have to have an understanding for us as uh, the in uh, regulatory user, as well as the industry, uh, about what they are, how they can be used in, in, in the regulatory arena. Um, and uh, want to make yeah, the proper training. This is, these are connected. And then we're lucky because in OPPT we're relatively small and we're going to take advantage and stand on the shoulder of the giants in ICFAM and other places, CAT, as we try to figure out how we're going to bring this forward. The other important thing I think about education, training, and collaboration is the importance of making sure the public is assured that we're still going to be protective of human health and the environment, even though we're going to be moving away from animal testing. And just quickly, this is the implementation part. So once we go through the first two of the three pronged uh, of, of, the, of the big figure, and this is what we put forward as, as, uh, as our proposal to implement the plan with some time frames. And here, we're gonna continue to use them where we can and have been in the past, but the big thing is the list. So the law says that we have to have a list of NAMs that pass some relevance and reliability criteria that we have to set forth. And so we, as I said, we kind of took that Casadi et al., which is the group from the OECD, and, and, and we put them forward. But what we're going to end up doing is, um, that we call them this Chapter 5 criteria because it's Chapter 5 in the, in the draft. But um, we're going to take those criteria and with the TNT, the Tosca NAM team, and, and really think hard about how they might be modified in this final draft and make sure that this list of NAMs is going to be a good list of what we consider um, NAMs that will be useful given certain contexts for prioritization as well as risk evaluation. And we did get a fair amount of comments on that. These are my two favorite parts. Because I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that people ask, well, Gina, what kind of studies do you ask for? And we, uh, I really don't have a good answer to that. 
because a lot of times we ask company for a study and they choose not to do it or they don't have to do it until they make a certain production volume, so we might not see it for eight, nine years from when we asked for it eight, nine years ago. So the point is, in order for us to feel comfortable about what we need and ask for under Tosca, we need to get a good handle on what we've asked for, what we've received, and so we're actually gonna do that um, simple analysis that's embarrassing to say openly, but is necessary to do for us to be able to have what we're calling our NAM foundation, Tosca NAM foundation. And then we also, during the same exercise, and this is gonna be in the first six months of the year, is have a good handle on our in-house inventory. So you have to remember, so Tosca 76, 79, the first inventory came out. So that means anything after that was not in the inventory is considered new. We actually approved about 36,000 chemicals. We have data on much of that. It's in an integrated um, IT system that's separate from the internet because it's CBI. So we still are using old systems, multiple databases that have not been tied together, which is why one of our big things is gonna be developing a, a relatively up, um, 20th century is fine. I don't, I don't need 21st century. Right? <laughs> I can live with 20th century. So I just want a new IT platform so we know what we have. Um, so anyway, those are the major near-term activities. And the uh, intermediate term, um, we want to hope in three to five years that we will have progress in prioritization and risk evaluation. These are kind of three things that we put in the plan based on comments we received where people were pointing out the tox uh, threshold of concern, which is a reasonable approach to look at chemicals in general, um, and, and uh, um, encouraging voluntary submitters to voluntary submissions from companies to use NAMs, as is required in 4H23, uh, 4H3. And then the possible use of NAMs in designing safer chemicals. Isn't the plan down the road to be a sustainable society that we're gonna be developing chemicals that should be better? And so we don't have, and so why not use NAMs where we can uh, to uh, do that? And then we're gonna have to continue with the list and the education and outreach and the collaboration, those are all important. And this is the long-term goal. We want to uh, move towards making Tosca decisions with NAMS in order to reduce and eventually eliminate vertebrate animal testing for Tosca. So the plan was released on March 7th. We had a public meeting on April 10th. Comments came and ended on May 11th. And we're gonna, we are gonna finish this, this date because we have to. And I just wanted to show people the 32 substantive comments. Um, I was a little disappointed in this, but you guys will be happy to know that the single one came from Hopkins. So, um, but it, it was a little disappointing that um, the, there weren't a lot of comments, in my opinion, by stakeholders, except for you know, the ones that have been involved since, since the beginning and have played a large role. So that is it. I'm sorry if I took extra long. And of course, I want to thank the, the team, the TNT, for all the work that they've done in the past six months. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Gino. Um, any burning question for him? You, you see something happening in the US agencies, but You'll hear also about what is happening at the FDA in a second um, with Susie Fitzpatrick, um, the third board member of CUT. And this one, okay. No, I have a couple of, sometimes I have problems with these slides. Good. Well, thank you very much you for, no, I'm fine. Can you hear me? Everyone can hear me? Thank you for asking me today to talk about the FDA predictive toxicology roadmap. Oops, this is, I got some things in here. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about three things today. First, our roadmap and how we got it. Second, our organs on a chip program. And third, this is really the year of the roadmap and there's also a fourth roadmap, the Tox 21 roadmap. Warren, both Warren and I are on Tox 21 and we helped work on this roadmap too. So we worked on two roadmaps at the same time. Well, actually I worked on three because I was on the ground too. So, um, 
So I think I don't really need to talk about the challenges here. I think everybody knows what the challenges are. I'm, I'm a regulatory scientist. People often forget a regulatory is a scientist, too. We understand science as well. We're just not at the bench. But, uh, and we also understand how we can use these tools to bring safer products. We all want the same thing, safer, better, safer products. And, uh, and a better way of proving it. So I think FDA recognized a while ago, a long time ago, I'm not as pessimistic as Warren about the regula regulators. We, we, in our 20, I guess, our advancing regulatory science plan, which was probably in 2010, I think, 2011, we said we wanted more predictive toxicology methods. That was the very first thing the commissioner said in the roadmap was more predictive toxicology methods, and these, including chips weren't so, as big a deal, but stem cells, um, uh, in vitro tests, everything. So working on that, um, we, we've had for a long time and are very open to new methods and encouraging people that are bringing a regulatory submission into us to talk to us. There, we have no legal requirements for animal studies. We, everything that's in a guidance is really FDA's best thinking at the time, but a guidance is merely a guidance. It's not a regulation, so it's not a law. So it's, it, it, certainly people can be, you know, as with any crowd of people, some are more open than others to new ideas, and that's the same thing in a regulatory agency. But I think you'll see by uh, creating a roadmap, all the senior toxicologists from every single program center committed to this. And, and that was the important thing about our roadmap. Um, and committed to trying to find out how we can have confidence in um, these. So the commissioner, tapped the, we developed in 2015 a senior toxicology working group, which was two or three senior toxicologists of each of our program offices, that's drugs, devices, biologics, tobacco, vet drugs, and foods, and NCTR and the Office of the Commissioner, to work together to try to advance new predictive toxicology methods. So we were going to all talk together. And we recognize that we all have different legal, legal statutory requirements. For our medical products, they can approve something on a risk-benefit analysis. So they, uh, a, a, um, Compound can have a lot of risk as long as it's got a benefit. So for an OTC product, over-the-counter product, there's not going to be a lot of risk involved. For a cancer drug, for example, you're going to allow a lot of, you're going to allow a risky product because the benefit might outweigh any risk. For um, drugs, for vet drugs, and for foods, we have um, reasonable certainty of no harm is our legal standard. Now, I think Congress recognized there's never absolute certainty, so it was reasonable certainty, though they didn't really define what reasonable meant. Reasonable certainty of no harm. And then for tobacco, it's really um, a, an equivalent um, um, statute. As long as the, the, um, the newer products are not uh, any more uh, harmful than the products on the market. So, and that's a little bit like devices, face, uh, uh, class two devices, where you have uh, 510Ks, where you come in and your device is, uh, is equivalent to other ones on the market. Um, and, that, and, and essentially like a generic product, too. So we've, they, the commissioner asked us to develop a predictive roadmap for uh, developing and integrating new predictive road uh, models. We did this out of the Office of the FDA Chief Scientist and the Office of the Commissioner. And we wanted to emphasize two things that are important to FDA. First, that we're going to qualify. We're, context of use is really a little bit like fitness for purpose that EPA uses, but we use context of use. It's a clearly articulated description of the manner and purpose of the job, of the, of the new tool. Remember, all of these methods are just tools for regula regulatory scientists to answer questions that they need to put a safe product and an effective product on the market. So they're not, you can think of them as down, we really think, so it, we want, if. The context of use is how this method is going to answer one of the questions that we need to answer to regulate a product. And qualification is the conclusion that this tool can be relied upon for this context of use without putting any underlying data in into a, submit, a regulatory submission. So once it's been qualified and that's been made public, then anybody can use that tool for this context of use without having to um, put any underlying data on how it works, you know, uh, specificity, sensitivity, et cetera. Now, you can use it, any tool for something else, but you're going to have to uh, talk about, um, you have to show that it works, in other words. and. Um, 
We have two formal programs that do this. We have a, a, a formal qualification program in CEDAR. It really started out a while ago with the Critical Path Initiative where they, um, they qualified six non-clinical uh, renal biomarkers. Now they're trying to qualify them for clinical trials. They're working on other biomarkers. We also have a, a um, qualification, a formal qualification program at CD, CDRH. But any toxicologist, senior toxicologist especially, can, can, if you come in with them and talk to them about a new method that you want to, to use, they, they can tell you the type of data they're going to need for that application, for that context of use. Uh, a formal program is really where you're willing to make that sort of public um, for anybody to use. Uh, and so there, there might be a lot of new methods that we do have in INDs or IDEs or something, but they're not public and so we can't talk about what, they, what they're there. Um, there was something else I was going to mention. You had the list of tissues up there that you use for an animal study. We may collect them, but we don't look at all of them. Only a few of them you do histopath on. And so learning what the target tissues are by in vitro things can eliminate the need for all those tissues because you, you know it's not, a chemical isn't going to affect every tissue. It's only going to affect certain ones. And even to put a drug into clinical trials, you only have to do some PPK modeling in a 30-day rat to put it into humans. So there's a lot of, and then later the big trials, the repro and developmental carcinogenic and chronic toxicity come if you want after phase two testing. So there alone, ICH has saved hundreds of animals because most drugs fail in uh, phase two testing, or 40% of them fail. So, so it's not as daunting a task as when you put it up there because really um, most of the time we've, we've figured out pretty well what the target tissues are and, um, and can concentrate on the to uh, toxic endpoints. And there might be some transitory um, effects with other tissues, but generally speaking, you're going to set your ADI or whatever your regulatory thing is on one target tissue and one effect anyway, so the one that's the most sensitive. Um, so going on, we also emphasize partnerships, and that's why I'll talk about the uh, organ on a chip partnership, which is a really successful partnership, more successful than we even imagined when DARPA came into the office of the commissioner with a picture of a funnel and a box and an arrow and said this is what they want to do for a chip. And we encourage partner, um, Public-private partnerships are not for one single drug manufacturer to come in and say, okay, I want a partnership with FDA to move my drug forward. That's really more some sort of qualification or meeting with, uh, I think, or, or we have a seminar series where people can come in and, and, and present a method if it looks promising. And um, it's really more to work on general things, like a public-private partnership. The Critical Path Initiative was a public-private partnership with, or it is still, with FDA, EMA, and pharmaceuticals and academics. And it was housed in Arizona. And it, it was to qualify biomarkers in general that anyone could use. So, we, And CEDAR has several public-private partnerships. So does CDRH. They usually start for FDA. They're started with a 503, whatever, non nonprofit. FDA can't start a public-private partnership. A profit and a nonprofit company can uh, start one and invite FDA to join. And if FDA can or is allowed to join, they will. So we're encouraging that. This is our roadmap. It came out December 6, 2017, with a blog from the um, FDA chief scientist. And it has six um, levels to it. I already talked about the senior level toxicology working group. And this has really been a great, a great um, thing for me. Uh, you know, when I bring Tox21 stuff back, I immediately broadcast it to the whole of FDA. This has really been a great thing for communication between the centers. I found out a lot more about what the other centers are doing. And I pretty much know all of, all of them anyway. But it's been a great thing. And then they take that information and they push it down to all their toxicologists. And I, I gave a, 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 um, a grand rounds a couple of weeks ago. And then the junior people, now they want a junior toxicology working group, but w which would be a good idea. But uh, so it was really exciting. Then communication is the key. I think that's really the biggest stomach block in any organization. You know, one office doesn't talk to another, or one doesn't, or one center doesn't talk to another, or one um, uh, agency doesn't talk to another. It, you know, that nobody knows what everyone's going, and everyone wants to know what's going on. And 
And so we're encouraging not only talking between federal agencies, and you'll see with Talks 21, when I started FDA, I would never be talking to EPA once a week. Now, not just on alternatives, but I talk to EPA a lot, and CATS, NIEHS, NTP. A lot of my job is just talking to the other federal agencies. So, and that wouldn't have happened a few years ago, and I think that's a key to making all this come forward. Um, we also want um, communications with our federal partners. We had at um, SOT, we had uh, FDA meets EU tox risk. I just got a note on how I can get into the EU tox risk um, pan panel. I, I was on the regulatory panel. So it's, it's partnerships internationally, too. That, and, and then I take that and I filter it down to our chip people. Maybe we can put a chip thing in. We're working with Craig on Reach Across, and, and we had talked to the people about a, a uh, uh, was a case study on Reach Across that we could put into there too. So um, we want to make sure, you know, FDA doesn't do discovery research. We do, um, and Congress considers NIH our discovery research arm. So most of the money for research in HHS uh, except for NIHS, which is the environment, goes well, that goes to NIH because they consider they're going to do the discovery research. So, what we do is um, we do uh, directed research to answer regulatory questions that we can't get one of our stakeholders to answer. And, and I think some of this, uh, looking at alternatives to answer some of the questions that we have to do, are, are important. So, for my center, most of the, um, most of the products that we in CIFSAN, uh, we have pre-approval authority over um, uh, direct food additives, color additives, and indirects, or food contact material, but cosmetics, dietary supplements, contaminants, constituents, which are heat process contaminants, we have no uh, pre-approval authority over. When you have pre-approval authority over, you can make someone do anything because they want to get that approval. But once it's, what's it, it, once it's in the market, or if you don't have any pre authority, we have to show our, our legal statute is to show harm. So R is a good center to use alternatives because somehow we have to show harm, but we have to be able to go to court on it too. So if I used an alternative to show the a harm with a dietary supplement, for example, and hoping to use read across for that, then, um, then I, um, oops, I'm gonna go back here. I've, it's just gone forward without me. Mm -hmm. I have to show harm. So. Going back to the roadmap goals, or has it really gone forward? So oh, the only thing I wanted to say there was oversight by the Office of the Commissioner. When the Office of the Commissioner or the Commissioner himself wants to know what you're doing and expects a report for you, usually it goes to the top of your list. So I think that was an important part of our roadmap is that we have to at least annually, but probably more often, um, talk to the commissioner about what each center is doing through our center director and up. And I, and I know that I, I just got a note from uh, the oncology people that the commissioner was about to give a talk and he's, he's put the roadmap in there. So that means more pressure on us to do something too. So, um, and, and so of course we're hoping that, that the roadmap will help us implement these new things. And I'm much more positive than uh, maybe other people because I really, you know, any, everything that is worthwhile, you have to take baby steps. But as long as the baby steps are going forward, and they are, and people are committed to going forward, things will happen. And we, we were committed, we've been committed for a long time, but everything is coalescing together to make it an easier pathway. Instead of uphill, it's starting to almost be straight and maybe downhill. So, um, so one, of the, one of the partnerships that we engaged in was the FDA, DARPA, NIH, or it became NCATS, Microphysiological Program. So whoever gives a talk gets to put their organization first. Hardly ever does FDA get their name first. But this started actually between FDA and DARPA. FDA, um, DARPA came to us for, um, we have an animal rule for uh, medical countermeasures where you can't really test a medical count a countermeasure for some of these like Ebola They can't really do a clinical trial and so you have an animal rule where you could use an animal for animal efficacy However, there's no animal efficacy models that are good enough to use under the animal rule to test uh, Medical countermeasures so they that's where the chip program started for us the human on a chip program was could they be used for uh, medical countermeasures and, and maybe also for orphan drugs where you're, you have a clinical trial of 10 people might have an orphan drug. Um, very few people, you can't have a clinical trial. Maybe a chip would help you um, gather enough data for these two type things because most orphans drug, drugs are 
are, would get expedited use, they're serious conditions where there's no particular um, uh, uh, remedy, and so that you're allowed to take a little bit more risk, especially if it's a fatal or a very, um, you know, um, debilitating disease. You can take more risk with a chip or a chip data. So it, the chip program looked like this. It just was completed last um, thing. The on uh, the DARPA side, it was it was was given two two um, thirty five million dollar. Uh, contracts were given, one to the VIS at Harvard and the other to MIT to do the DARPA bioengineering platform. There, to have um, all of the uh, organs on a chip, ten, you had to have 10 organs viable for, um, or actually 10 tissues viable for four weeks using human, uh, human, uh, in uh, human cells. You have to, had a list in there of about 10 or 12 compounds that you were gonna run through and uh, and then, you, um, and then you also had to have a commercialization uh, plan. You had to be able to commercialize this so that DARPA wasn't giving a lot of money to somebody that was then gonna keep it as proprietary because that had happened a couple of times in the past. And as we started this program, N NIH came on board and said they wanted to be part of it too. And so they developed first some uh, uh, stem cell and cell cell um, grants of which Thomas got one of those. That was for about 24 months and then they had some, they were supposed to be developing uh, disease, organ disease models on a chip um, that could plug and play into one of the two uh, humans on a chip. So you took out the, you took out the, and they were all academic, so you took out the academic disease liver and you put it into like the VIS, take out the VIS, good liver and put in the disease liver. So I, that part of it didn't really seem to happen. They did develop a lot of organs on a chip, but they have a second phase now where they're giving out uh, where they're giving some models for disease, disease models on a chip, which is really exciting. This program, and talking about communication, there was a ton of communication. We met, so FDA was there at the very beginning. We helped choose the DARPA grants, which two got to it. We met with those two, MIT and Harvard, once a month and listened to their progress. For the DARPA and the, uh, we, we were at the, test the meeting where they, the study section meeting where they chose the NCATS grants. And we helped, uh, we helped um, on the DARPA and NCATS developing their test pro, uh, compounds because for, if they were doing a liver on a chip, we had our liver people there from uh, drugs and other places. So we helped them identify what, what compounds we would recommend to put through their chips. And we met twice a year, the whole group met twice a year to talk about it and ended in um, last May. And this is the program there, and and as a result of it, they they started a um, they started a uh, two test testing centers where they in uh, MIT not MIT and uh, Texas A and M they're testing the chips. But we also because we've been there because I got to know the VIS very well because we had originally given the VIS a grant for the heart lung uh, monitor through the NIH. Um, uh, an NIH program, we did a crater with Emulate to move it into our own lab, the liver on a chip at first. Now we're getting the gut on a chip too, which we didn't do much press. We did a, a blog. We didn't really even do much of a rollout, just a blog, and we were just shocked at how much publicity we got on moving this into our lab. Um, this The next day, Nature put something in there, and we still get a lot of um, interviews for uh, people calling up and wanting to know what's going on with our chip. So also, so when our CRADA, we were talking with the liver on a chip, we were gonna beta test the emulate system, we were, which is a little, it's got a little um, container, a Zoe that they call it, where you can put chips in, so it's easier for other developers. We were gonna look at concordance of chip data with the data that we have. We were gonna begin to develop performance standards, and, and our scientist is developing a paper on conformance standards, because we found that Emulate really didn't understand what GLPs were and how to meet GLPs, and just simple things that if you were on, on, in that uh, witness chair and the, uh, the a lawyer was saying, well, wait a minute, how did you know that chip was really growing and you have no way of doing some of these things? Uh, you're just gonna get, no matter how great your data is, you're just gonna get thrown out. So there's a lot of things that if you want it for regulatory use, you have to meet. And so um, he's kind of putting together a paper and then we're gonna go out to our stakeholders to work on that. Um, and we wanted to have a, make our center a resource for FDA regulators and researchers. Remember we said people need to see things, like we just turned on our computers recently and it was 
Microsoft 2016, you know, holy God, I don't know how to use this. I can't use this. I, what happened to 10, you know? And, and it's kind of the same thing with the new method, test method. You open up a, a, a IND and you have a user fees, so you have, you know, statutory requirements that so you have to get it done and get it to the advisor. And you see something you've never seen before and you're going to go, ah, <laughs> what, where's the old test? So that's why encouraging people to come in pre-IND, pre-IDE, pre-FAP and talk about new methods, but also if you want to, um, uh, come to us for training, we, we had Craig came in and, beta, and demoed, and Thomas came in and demoed Reach Across, and, it was, and people really liked it, and enough so that we said, okay, we can have a, a tech transfer or some kind of agreement to bring it in, and people can really play with it and see if this is a good system. So we've had chip meetings, we've had other meetings where you bring in different, different technologies and you talk to them about it. We also, also DARPA kind of had wanted to get out of the chips when they, when they, DARPA kind of does something, makes a big splash and then takes on for something else. So they had thought that after five years they weren't going to do any more chips, they were going to go on to something. But it was such a big deal that when we had the closeout for the DARPA grants, um, uh, DARPA said, you know, well, we still want to do a chip. So we said, okay, why don't you give us some money for uh, a chip center? Give us a grant to set up a chip center. So. Between CIFSAN and CEDAR, we pushed very hard on DARPA, and they came up with two big grants for us to set up chip centers. Uh, we're setting up more of a center in ours, and, and we're working with Emulate, which is the VS, and then CEDAR's working with uh, C and Bio, which is the uh, uh, spinoff of MIT. Remember, those were the two DARPA grants. To first focus on the liver and then focus on other things. So we're, we, we got enough money to you know expand our lab to make it start to open it to other people and to really concentrate on chips. Okay, so then let's go on really quickly to the Talks 21 partnership, which I can't believe Thomas thought did, forgot about because this is actually the first partnership. And it, it this is between, this started in, I think it started in 20, 2008, right after the uh, tox testing in the 21st century. And the reason that only, I told the reason, the reason only covered chemicals is that FDA was asked to be part of it, and mistakenly FDA said, no, we don't want to, you know, so. So, and that was, that was a mistake we're still paying for, I think, because a lot of the principles in tox testing in the 21st century, especially lots and lots of chemicals with no data, doesn't really apply to FDA. So a lot of the things that are developed in response to that don't really apply to our compounds. And so, so they started a, an MOU. First it was with um, NIH, NIH, NCATS, NTP, and EPA. And then I think they asked FDA and later because they really thought we could give them some human data. So, um, so we re-signed this in 20, um, 2015. CIFSAN is the lead agency for FDA. And you've seen this before, we all have challenges, but we all intersect in a different place. And where we all intersect is what really TOX21 is. So not the TOX21 program that this MOU covers doesn't cover every alternative method. It covers things that cross over between our centers. Um, and we, ex we expanded the uh, new strategic plan to include not only high throughput screening, but especially, and especially FDA pushed this organs on a chip, C. elegans, zebrafish, in silico, other in, in vitro methods, 2D methods, stem cells. So it covers everything now, not just high throughput screening. And these are some of the things we're focusing on. We have five things to focus on, which would be to look at other methods of human toxicity, to address the challenges that we saw on the high throughput screening. They want to curate and make a database of all the high throughput screening data, and also the um, tox ref. RFB, which is the animal data, and look at validation, and then look at pharmacokinetics, and um, the management team then works with, oops, we have a management team, which uh, uh, Warren and I are on, so there's like eight of us. Then we developed a cross-partner projects, which are really projects that more than one agency cross over and are interested in, but not just interested in, they're going to put some uh, skin in the game, so to speak. They're going to do some bench research. So yeah, I might be interested in what this cross-partner project is, but I've, if I can't have my researchers working on it, I'm not part of it. I can listen to it. But I, then we have some infrastructure um, th uh, teams. We have someone to do the chemical library management. We have communications, which is we have a website. Is talks21.gov? 
is, I think it's live now, or it's going to go live for the whole Talks 21. And an assay evaluation and screening. And then this is just a list of the cross-partner projects that are now. And in the FDA incubator, as I call it, we have possibly bioprinting, because we're working with NCATS on, on bioprinting of skin. We have organs on a chip, which we'd like to expand. We have, um, we're working on C. elegans and zebrafish. So those are all their cross-partner projects that are, that are thinking of coming. And we sort of um, put the um, cross-partner projects in, um, they have to come and justify, they have to meet with us every quarter um, and talk about their um, progress because in the past we had some projects and they just didn't go anywhere really. And so now they have to, they come and they're approved by the agencies and then they have to report to us that they're making progress and they can't make progress, we see what we can do to help them. I also forgot to mention for our FDA roadmap, we're gonna have a, in the, in the fall, we're gonna have a, a um, public meeting on it. The public meeting is really, it's, I think the commissioner is going to open it and hopefully can stay for part of it. It's not going to be us presenting things. It's going to be asking you uh, for input. And our Federal Register Notice has a lot of questions that we'd like input on. But, but all of our stakeholders are welcome to put input on anything else. So that's going to be at our wide up facility. Uh, the Federal Register Notice should come out pretty soon. I can send it, make sure Thomas knows about it so we can send it to everyone. And I encourage everyone to come or call in. Or Of course, we have a docket, too. Usually you open a docket like 30 days before, 40 days before, and then maybe keep it open for um, 30 days afterwards. So now I'll talk about uh, Future Talks 4, which everyone needs to come to. This is, this is the first Future Talks, and we think maybe it shouldn't be Future Talks anymore, but Almost Here Talks. Uh, for because it's not so much in the future as it was when we had Future Talks 1. And this is one that's just uh, just on looking at one endpoint, which is predictive toxicology for hu healthy children, which is uh, um, all the DART studies. So we do have a DART ICFAM group that FDA chairs, and we know that looking at alternatives for DART is a really a stretch project. But as I said before, um, those studies are just tools to answer questions that um, that you need to answer to. And my questions for a food is different than what I have for pharmaceuticals. Is different than Gino has, different than EPA. But some of the questions are the same. So though, although we've gone through the regulations, I, as a regulator, I'm not so concerned about the regulations because regulations can be changed. We can use regulatory discretion. Most things aren't in regulations. What we're concerned about, when we're making a list of the questions that we want answered. So we have, we, we have a list that we're all working on. These are the questions for, we're starting with developmental talk. These are the questions we want answered from any tool, for any tool. And then we're going to try to match some of the alternatives to the questions. Okay, so one of the things we're, so if question one, and maybe if there's an alternative that looks like it might give us some answers for that, um, we, we, would, we could then talk to the developer and see what, what they would need to do to move it forward, okay? And um, so one of the things we're encouraging people that have DART methods to do is to bring your poster to, the, uh, to this meeting. And we'll be there at the, the DART ICFAM group. We'll be there. In fact, I'm hoping we can have our own poster at the poster meeting to, to see, if, look at all the methods and talk to people and see which ones could possibly answer our questions. And I guess even we could put what the list we have of questions on there. So with that, I've run out of time, right? And Thank you very much. I hope you get a better idea of the positivity at FDA for our alternatives. So, and the energy. Good. So I think this were three great presentations, and we should move to the discussion part instantly. If I may ask you to come over here and use the microphones, because we are, as you know, we are streaming uh, that we can, that you can be heard. Um, and uh, I, I think it's an exciting time. There's, uh, there seems to be a real change and, uh, is an, and a commitment across these uh, yes, major agencies who are setting standards worldwide. Um, I think this is a, um, a good time for alternative methods. And I would like to say uh, we, are going, uh, we have obviously consumed some of the discussion time. Um, afterwards, uh, we would invite all of you um, to the ninth floor where we will have a reception, um, some refreshments, a little booze, and yeah. Uh, so please join us and uh, after after this discussion. So who's gonna start, Andre? Uh, I would like to follow up on Philip 
Eins, zwei, drei. Uh, I would like to follow up on, on, on what you said um, um, from, from a little bit different perspective of my misunderstanding of what a, in the past of what is an OECD test guideline is and what it's not. Uh, and maybe I'm totally wrong, so please correct me or, uh, or not. Um, so an OECD test guideline itself doesn't help you. It's just, it just means that if national regulators implement this OEC test guideline into their regulatory demands that if your company is, is, is located in country A, you can do the testing in country B under GLP and can use it in country C to transmit it. But the, the OECD test line itself has no value because it needs to be implemented Uh, into the national guidelines from FDA, EPA, and so on and so on. No. Uh, no. So, if your country is a member of OECD, yeah, mm -hmm. and some somebody tests using an OECD test guideline under mm -hmm. GLP, that falls under mutual acceptance exactly. of data. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so there is no requirement that your country says, "Okay, I'm an OECD and I accept that method." They're supposed to, but the reality is. That's that not, they will accept right. the data, but they may not accept it. We, we may the, need more data. Yeah. We, yeah. I mean, it's, the, not, it's not going to be automatic. BCOP is a great example. It's, that's an OECD test guideline. Yeah. EPA off-specicides will not accept BCOP data. This is exactly right. what I mean. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, maybe it's a difference in wording, but just because something is an OECD test guideline, at least in the United States, does not guarantee yeah. that the data, and it shouldn't be, because yeah. a lot of those guidelines have never been validated to meet the needs of the regulatory agencies. There are just too many of them. That's why you come in and meet with a regulatory agency before you start your testing, pre clinical testing, and say, I want to use, like, we, I think drugs take speak up, but, but we wouldn't for cosmetics, because it doesn't, doesn't go down to n little or no irritation. So it's, it's like, You come in, that's why we encourage people to come in and talk to, talk to a regulatory agency, and I'm sure it's the same in EPA, um, at least in EPA pesticides, mm -hmm. where you come in and you talk about what you're going to put in before. You know. So some of our, CEDAR especially has a guideline on type A, type B, type C meetings. And I mean, if you go, if you request the meeting and you send in the questions ahead of time, you know, EPA is probably the same way. FDA will not answer impromptu, impromptu questions. So you send in the questions ahead of time. You let us talk about it and decide what we'll answer, and then we'll talk to you about them. So I think Kate probably knows more than yeah. anybody here about this. So. Yeah. <laughs> you want to answer a question I just for wanted to make sure that people don't leave with the impression that OECD test guidelines are useless. Oh, yeah. um, I think. Um, The methods that are contained within a specific test guideline are uh, fit for, or they have a certain applicability domain, which um, OECD is, is, is refining as they go along and making clearer as they go along. But because the in vitro methods often have restricted applicability domains, they, um, you often need several methods to cover everything. So there's a lot now a movement toward what's called performance-based test guidelines which are, are uh, performance-based. I mean, there's a performance standards that the, that the tests have to meet, but they, um, the tests can have different applicability domains. So you just have to be careful. It's like a QSAR, you know? You have to make sure that you're using the test appropriately for your chemistry, and also within your regulatory. Um, so under MAD, you know, the country may accept the data, but they also might require additional um, data, which is a big problem because, um, You know, the whole point was international harmonization, and um, I think people are more aware of this now, and they're trying to um, try not well, to. I mean, even with the FDA, we're so diverse that if I might take data, one of my other centers won't take it because they use it for something different. So I think uh, we, we have often in our red book, the old, which hasn't been updated for a while, we do have some OECD guidance, but just looking at the repro and developmental, the DART animal study, there's a big difference between the one gen and the two gen, and the, the one gen is not the one gen at NIHS, and we don't like either one of them, so even though that's a test guideline now, it, you know. It's not applicable for it, 
it's not an alternative, but yeah. just saying that. Um, but the EPA has just come out with their draft guidance that for skin sensitization, where right. these three test guidelines, they will, they, they've said, we will accept these. So when an agency does that, that makes it a lot easier and everybody's happier. Mm -hmm. I, oh, sorry, uh, can I ask a question? Sorry, Marty, can I just, yes, so sorry, Gino. Um, you, you, I've heard you say this a couple times, that um, the uh, new TOSCA requires that the NAMs provide information of equivalent or better scientific quality, and, and that, that's a high bar. I just kind of want to ask you why you feel it's such a high bar, because um, some of the, you know, the, the recent studies that have gone back and looked at the animal data like that the Nicenum is doing has shown that actually maybe it's not such a high bar. The reproducibility is not so good. The variability is huge. So I just, could you give me a little more insight why you think it's a, a high bar? Uh, that's a fair point. Um, I, I, you know, I've come to realize that, you know, the gold standard of the animal study is not the true gold standard. I think what, uh, I, I use the term high bar because of the or of better scientific quality. I mean that that that's the that's a high bar to me because I do think that part of the education and uh, confidence is going to be moving away from something that may not be the best, may not be easily uh, interpreted, and may not truly uh, be the human condition, but it's what people have been comfortable with for a long time, and just saying that what we're doing is going to be better, and I, I think that's where we want to go. So, you know, maybe I'm mischaracterizing it by saying it's a higher bar, but um, I do think it's a high bar, and I think it's where we should be going. I don't know if that answers you directly, but that's, that's what I think. Gino, <coughs> Marty, <coughs> Marty Stevens, Kat. Um, I was also going to ask about the same thing, scientific quality. So the revised TOSCA talks about relevance and scientific quality. How do you understand scientific quality? Is it this sort of performance metrics, some of which Kate just mentioned, of variability, or reliability, et cetera? I mean, all those are at play. I mean, I know, like, you know, the, the, the relevance and reliability and building the confidence, to, to me, that, that's what it's all about in building the scientific quality so you're comfortable. I don't have a, a simple answer as to what that may mean for NAMS. I'm learning something every day. I mean. To me, I think the concept of um, the performance-based standards make perfect sense. And I think m most of us are gonna be on board as that starts to go through the OECD process and it's incorporated in groups such as ourselves as we build our system. But, but to be one of the more interesting things to me was last week I didn't go to the ICFAM meeting because I was at the EPA STAR grant on organotypic culture models down in RTP, so I had a chance to sit and meet with the four centers that got all, these, all this money from EPA to work up these new chip models. And there was a huge disconnect between what, what we were asking for and what they're developing, and it's just like what Warren talks about. But one of the more interesting and important things was if you know Vanderbilt did their model and they can't quite scale it up yet because when Wisconsin tries it, they don't get the same result, which everyone understands that's part of the scientific process. But I think the important thing as we start developing these new methods is we do have to come up with some way to feel comfortable and confident in the reproducibility about a, of a model no matter where it is. And so the performance-based way, you know, Way, is the way to go, but then that screams about the uh, applicability domain, because that's what it is all about. So anyway, I, I don't have a simple answer, but that's kind of the way I think about it. Uh, thanks. I uh, wanted to direct this question at, at Gino and Susie, although Warren, I'd certainly be interested in, in your insights as well. Um, this is a plea from um, a poor academic. Um, over the past probably four or five years, we have uh, worked with doctoral students, master's students, and undergrads trying to use publicly available data to learn more about how and where new approach methodologies, alternatives might be useful. Um, it's been very frustrating on two levels. First, there are situations where the information is allegedly available, but it's extremely hard to access. 
That's a technical IP issue. So that's one thing to consider. Second, there are situations where we're just told that the data is confidential. Now we understand that there is a need and uh, for confidentiality, it's in the law, but that doesn't mean that agencies can't work harder perhaps and, th and more creatively in a way to make the data available. So I, I wanted to ask you directly what you can do about this and also um, ask you to give, not give me the answer that your lawyers are telling you it's not possible. Thank you very much. For that. <laughs> I can't use the lawyer card? Sorry. <laughs> You're a lawyer. That's why you can't use it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you asked all the right questions in the right ways, and I don't have a simple answer except to say, um, and I'm not going to say the lawyer, but if a company checks the box that it's CBI, where our hands are tied, under the new law, we're taking much greater steps at trying to um, m m uh, make sure that that is justified and to go after companies after a certain number of years once something's in commerce to s remove it. But to, to me, the bigger issue is, as you may already know from, as a science, so when we publish the PMN stuff and we give a generic name, that really doesn't mean anything. Mm. But it's an acceptable generic name for two reasons. It doesn't disclose how the chemical's made and, and then it, it, it shows so, so no one else can make it, right? But it has nothing to do with the hazard. And that's what worries me. So um, I, I'm kind of going towards the direction of, as you know, we have Derek and other proprietary software, they're, they're starting to go in a direction of, even though you might not be able to see all the training and test information, there has to be some kind of a third party availability to feel comfortable with the confidential information so that people who use that tool can use it. Uh, and I'd like to think that we're gonna go in that direction as well. Because I think that's, we do have to get around this. And so I think it's recognizable. But anyway, that, let, let Warren. So, 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 well, then, so that's something that, that's, that, that's a huge problem. Access to data is something that we're working on because the reality is that the majority of the information in those documents are not, is not confidential. It's certain pieces are, so our group is actually cleared for confidential business, business information. Mm -hmm. We take documents from the EPA and extract the information, but that's the problem. When we, so we just did 800 pesticides. We got all six pack data out it's mm -hmm. on the web now for people. That data is not sent in any kind of standardized way. It's not like I can go to section two, table four, and pull the third column and get some. It's all yeah. almost random. It's scanned PDFs, not even converted PDFs, scanned PDFs. Mm -hmm. So it makes it hard to do machine reading on it. Um, it's, and a lot of times it's not a matter of people not wanting to give you the data. It's that the data is not in a format that makes it easy to work with. So that's something that we're trying to get around. But you know, having worked in pharma, I was amazed to learn. I wanted some access to some study data. It was like, here's a PDF. Like, we don't have a database. You can't go back and tell me. And the answer is no, we don't. We have these PDFs or Word files. Um, but it's changing with the new send format that the FDA is requiring and pharmas is starting to comply with. So in the future, I think it'd be much easier to get to the information that we need without having to go through that process where we can export those parts easily because they're machine readable. So all, all data by the government is, is public, first of all. All food additive data in the food additive pro it's public Clinical data. trials data isn't. Clinical trial data isn't, but if you look at drugs at FDA, you get all the memos for um, the farm talks, the medical review memos, and they're so detailed you can figure out what went on. And we were able to take those out and use them for read across with EPA on, when we were looking at pharmaceuticals and the environment. So there was enough data in there to do read across on, and those are FOIable, and they're also on our web. Um, I, I think one thing I want to make sure people understand, you, you, the health, the health the hazard information is not confidential. But to me, the value for Tosca is equating the hazard information with the structure. And you can't do that. And, and I think that's 
unfortunate for academics and the public because that ability is not there. So you have to trust us, which I know you do. <laughs> but, but the structure is in the farm talks memos. And all the, it's, they're right there, right there, and you can, and they're all the data and what we decided about them. You can't do that. It's not for You can't do that. But for, but most people will try to get this farm. When you get a drug, you get the get the chemist. You get the insert. In yeah, you get the, in, in the insert anyway, so. To address Paul's question again. Pardon? Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, this, <laughs> that's sorry. This may be a naive question from an envious Canadian. I, uh, it's really nice to see your strategic roadmaps and the, the legislative mandates to drive the change away from animal testing. But who's really driving this? Um, so Warren, you know, you showed how you've got you know the acute talks and the skin sensitization and that sort of thing that's already ongoing. But there's a plethora of other tests, obviously. So who is going to be saying, okay, we need to start developing these. We need to start going down this road. Like, who, is that industry? Is that uh, um, a combination? I mean, is that, so who is really going to make sure that this is going to happen in a timely manner so that within 10 years or 20 years, we're going to see significant change away from animal testing? So part of that gets back to the, the image. I mean, the, the LD50 test just has to go. The Dre's test just has to go. That's, I don't know who could argue with that. And, and the fact that we even have it around now is an embarrassment to all toxicologists. So things like that, I think, are the easy targets. And then when we had the EPA step up and commit to moving away from the six pack by 2020, that makes it easy for me to, I know where I'm putting my resources. If they're gonna step up and do that, I'm gonna give them all the support they need. Um, and then at least from the ICBAM perspective, the agencies determine you know, what the next big thing is. You know, developmental talks, read across, IVIB, and that comes from, from their needs. And you know, so that's how we're setting, or ICVAM sets its priorities, but then each agency has their own priorities as well. And, and we might be working on things that we're just not talking about right now. I mean, we, are, we have a little plan in my center that, and some goals, but they're, they're not goals that we're sharing publicly. But uh, device is just set in a guidance that they will take in vitro and comp tox and in, uh, rather than a rat carcinogenicity study for biomaterials. So it's happening. We don't have a legal mandate to do it, but we're still doing it at FDA. So because we recognize that we need more predictive models to cover the gaps that animal testing doesn't give us. So. You will soon have to come to an end. So I have two more <coughs> questions here. And I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately to close up with these two. So, uh, Roger, if you still Well, if there are two questions, that's great because I was going to give an answer. So somebody else can get in here. <laughs> Just to address Paul, and I'm only bringing this up in a way because it's, it's po it, to me it's a bit positive. Uh, but to go back to um, perhaps typewriters as opposed to computers, uh, we found that actually if you have the name of the company and talking to some toxicologists in the company, you can get individual pieces of data, uh, hazard association, uh, because people want to, sh at this point, are beginning to want to share those data and show good intent for what they're doing. Now that's a, that's going piece by piece by piece, but I think it's positive that uh, we've had some re uh, quite a bit of reasonable success with having people go back, scour through the files, and do manual transcriptions of data that they have. Yeah, François Busquet, uh, Cat Europe. Then again, also to, to react to what Paul said regarding access to data. Uh, there might be some good initiatives right now in, at the European side with the two main EU agencies, EFSA for the food safety and ECA with the chemical agencies. They have decided to harmonize their data sets and to make also sense of all this data that they have accumulated so far. So they started the work in January and probably by next year you'll see some effects already. Okay. So we have saved the time for the last question. <laughs> Please. So hi, um, my name is Bill Daly. I'm actually from, I took part in the NIH tissue chip program and also I'm part of one of the EPA star centers. So I was actually sitting last week on, the, uh, on a panel on the OPSIS side last week. 
How you doing? So it's, yeah, good seeing you. <laughs> so this has been great to uh, see the feedback we got directly you know, from the EPA. Um, and I think what you know tends to happen is on from the you know, us on the developer side is we often don't see you know the overarching framework of what all the agencies are doing. So in order for us to be able to you know answer those questions or see where we want to fit, I think these kind of meetings would be very important, particularly for all the researchers you know in our centres in order to, you know, to structure how we're designing our systems to better fit what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So I think that disconnect happens a lot. Like I go to the NIH tissue chip meeting, for instance, with, our, with some other principal investigators and I'll come back and then that information doesn't really trickle down into the center as a whole. So we miss that. So kind of getting a way where maybe people can come to us or some other way where, you know, we can broadly tune into these kind of framework meetings, I think would really guide our hands. So I guess it's not more a question, it's more of a, a better way of maybe trying to integrate the academic and you know the, the regulatory interactions we could have in the future. Thank you. Okay. Any final words from our panelists? Uh, just to address that, so I will. Dan Tagley is part of the group we work with, so I'm, I'll probably need to talk to him about better ways of, of, of doing some outreach and making sure people are better connected. Because they have the meetings, but I think you're right. I think there's a lot yeah, of other yeah, things yeah, that yeah. can happen right. in, in between those meetings that we could we could really benefit from both sides. Well, they need more dialogue. I mean, the meetings are, the, it's a confidential, about, the yeah, meetings are confidential because it's still, you know, even, even we have a, our emulate, we have the emulate chip, our other lab has the MIT chip, but we're not allowed the companies won't allow us to compare data with each other for the same compound. So it's still confidential, but I think general principles about some of these things, we can be more communicative to. I mean, with, um, and I think one example is the CHIP program, the IQ Consortium, which is all the farm talks people, came to the CHIP meeting because FDA was there, and, and, and they're more willing now, to, they're sharing some of the data and stuff with the chip people or individual chip people and helping them on it. And I think that's an example of a partnership for, for the chips, you know, at least. To yeah, I guess it just seems to be an evolutionary process where, you know, as time goes on, we're working better, as you said, you know, communicating better, collaborating together. And I can't remember the last C was, but, you know, something that's in the Commitment. Commitment. Yep. Yeah, there we go. Well, we're committing yeah. to what we're saying. And I, I just want to quickly clear up. Every time I give a talk, I get I talk to somebody and they say, oh, you're so down on tissue chips. So that's not the case. I'm, the tissue chip developers have done an amazing job. They they did what we asked for. Now it's like, okay, how are you going to use it? Uh, well, no, are people going to beat a path I, to my I'm, door? Well, I'm a chip person. I, th yeah. I see plenty of reasons, it, things for chips to use. It's, a, it's an amazing uh, I, technology, I, I, but it's we can't just click our heels three times and say tissue chip, tissue chip, and be transported to the future. There's a there's a lot more thinking that's not quite as fun and sexy that has to happen. You have to click four times. You have to click four times. Well, I okay, mean, I, wonderful. I, uh, we have heard. <laughs> uh, so we had the three C's. We had a lot of communication now. Um, we will start collaborating tomorrow on the CAT program. And thanks a lot to our speakers again. Thank you.